Hello, my name is Nigel Griffiths. I work at IBM in the UK. I'm a technical staff member. This video is in the AX in Focus series and we're concentrating this time on Workload Manager. Everybody calls it WLM, even that appears in the commands we're going to use. So what is the point of this thing? Well, if we have a large AX server, there may be maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands of processes running and you can't monitor them individually. Here I've only got 20 processes coming and going on the CPU and it's a mess already. Imagine what this graph would look like with a thousand lines. In actual fact, Excel would refuse to draw you the graph because you end up with a square or an oblong full of lines. It just looks like a brick. Now, large servers typically are running maybe a dozen or so workloads, each with many processes inside. And examples of workloads that I'm referring to here are relational databases, batch jobs, data transfer, exporting files and reports, user applications as they come in and ask for things to be done. And we've got security tools, backup, and a whole bunch more. And some of those you may have multiple. You may have multiple databases and multiple applications on the one server. So what we're gonna do is WLM is going to put the processes into classes and then we can monitor and control those classes. The control is optional, you don't have to do that. But all of a sudden you can now see what these workloads are doing because you've only got a couple of handfuls of workloads and you can see which workloads are taking up the bulk of the resources, monitoring CPU memory and block IO, and if they're going wrong or behaving unusually. We can also classify processes with uh, manually with a command, uh, WLM assign, and that allows you to get around some tricky combinations where the commands may have the same name, but it's actually attached to a different database, as an example. Now, do not confuse, Workload Manager, WLM, which we're covering here, core part of AIX, it's installed on every AIX since AIX 4.33, I believe, and another tool called the Workload Partition Manager, WPAR Manager for short. That's a graphical user interface for managing workload partitions. Workload partitions are something else entirely, and this particular workload partition manager is no longer available. However, workload partitions came after workload manager, and they're called WPARs. That technology actually switches on workload manager and creates workload manager classes to allow you to monitor and control your workload partitions. Fortunately, there's a very nicely written red book 20 year old one uh, covers all the functions in detail and some of the uh, advanced features that I don't really use. So in this video, I'm going to get you started with the concepts and see why you actually want to switch this on and use it. I'm going to refer any questions you send me back to the red book and it will just say read chapter 3.5 or something to look at that topic. I also found that in the X manual, there are manuals for the various workload management commands and the files. But there's a whole section in the managing AIX uh, for workload manager. And again, it's got a lot of information that's very simply written uh, by the developers themselves. For some reason, it's in the documentation under device management, which I can't honestly explain, but it had to go somewhere. So there it is if you're looking for it. Now we have to assign all our processes to these workload management classes. And uh, we can do that based on two files, although we could use Smitty. I've got a whole lot of panels to doing this. Um, or we can actually use some underlying WN commands like make a class, list a class, change a class, and remove a class. But by the time you've worked out all the uh, parameters for using those commands, you might as well just go straight into perhaps etc. WLM current classes copy the an example of what you want to do in the file, cut and paste it, and change the details for your particular new class. That would take me four or five seconds. It would take me four or five minutes to get the syntax for the command right to do that. So we can classify processes based on the, we've got the, on the left-hand side, we've got the name of the classes. We've got the username who started it up. That can be used to put it into a particular class. So if you have a, a DBA, user then if he starts something or she then it also may go into the relational database class as an example we can also do it by group names perhaps you don't have one dba you have a whole group of people that do the database administration so you just name the group anybody in that group starts it then it can be done 
And another way of doing it is by um, application. This is uses the rules file. So you can say, you know, particular binary programs, if they start up, they're in a particular class. And we can put uh, wildcards in there. So we'll use a local bin star. That will pick up anything in that directory. So nice and clever. And we also got to the uh, shriek or the bang. So we can say, for example, games um, that users Bob and Ted can't play games. And uh, the managers can't play games. Well, it means it doesn't go into the games class if they do. Now we have exceptions, uh, so that if you've got a particular complicated combination, it needs to be a particular process with a particular argument you're looking for, then if you can find the processes with a ps command, then you can find the PID, and then you can use this WLM assign, then the name of the class and the process ID. Um, or you could have uh, with commas separated list of uh, processes, which is a bit of an unusual units commands, comma separated list, but there we go, that's what we got. Now an example of using that is perhaps you want to run your batch uh, and have a series of classes for the different phases of the batch. And you typically start up a batch running by a script, a shell script. So here's an example, we're gonna run batch runner with some parameters. Um, once you've set that going, if you in the corn shell, the uh, the dollar dollar equals the PID of the last process it started. So we can use the WLM assign the class name batch eight and the PID of the thing we just started, and that will push that into the right class. Very easy to use actually. Um, so we have nothing to install. Uh, AX five six nine one seven seven point three. Uh, they've all got this built in. Nothing to install. To activate it, we're using this WLM control. I think the developer had something wrong with their, the um, O key in the keyboard because the control has two of the O's missing, but there we are. That's sort of weird, but there we are. Um, A to activate it, P for passive, which means activate it, but don't start controlling things. So you would have switched it on to see how the workloads are behaving right now. And um, if you change some of the uh, files or the configuration, then you use a U for it to go and do an update, go and look at those files and uh, carry on running. And to stop it, it's minus O. <laughs> I don't know why O, but maybe it's for off or something. I don't know, but there we are. That's what we got. Very easy, no complications there at all. Then if you've got some things uh, created, we'll show you how to do that in a second, what I'm doing in this example. We, um, we can run this WLM stat command, and if you just type it in, you get it once, and it comes out like this. The, the top uh, one, two, three, four, five classes are already defined for us, and then typically the system processes go in there. Default is there anything you can't find a, another class to put them in. And so initially, a lot of stuff would be in default. All your applications would probably be in there. But I've created uh, applications, relational database, and batch uh, classes, put processes into those classes. And then we can immediately see the, the database is taking the bulk of the CPU and the vast majority of the memory. And uh, my workloads aren't using any disk IO at the moment. That's because they are faked. I'm using some of my end stress tools to actually just generate some CPU and memory load and not actual disk IO. That's good. If you wanted to run this and it output on a regular basis, it's a little bit like IO stat. So it's the number of seconds and how many times you wanted to repeat it and off it would go. If you don't put in the how many times you want to repeat it, it just does it forever on your screen. And so it'll roll up the screen every five seconds in this case. There's another tool, uh, Enmon, as part of the operating system. What a beautiful output in here. And this is a default install as well. And so that looks remarkably similar. And that's exactly what I intended to do. In here, you can see also some desired numbers. Of course, we're not controlling it. If you look under the shares column, uh, a little bit to the right, they're all minus ones. And that's saying that they're not being controlled. They're, they're, they're off. Um, which is fine, that's the way I wanted to set it up, which means that there's no restrictions on the CPU memory and I.O. So any of these classes can use 100% of the CPU, up to 98% of memory, because there's some things we have to have in memory just to run Unix. Um, and again, no restrictions on the I.O. at the moment. So here's my successor for N1 in J1, a bit more dynamic and a bit more interesting. I actually did the capture here while I was setting up my fake workloads and you can see them coming again. Before I actually started them properly, um, these bits and pieces that I was playing with were going into the default uh, class. This is the uh, CPU consumed. 
So um, all the CPU power we have adds up to 100%. So you how much of the, well, I could say computer, but it could be a, an L part or a virtual machine. Over in here, because we're running uh, AI, it's on the power machine. This is the number of physical CPUs involved. So we're peaking up here to three CPUs. This is much more interesting if you're trying to do capacity planning because you can add those up across l -pars to work out how big a machine, 100% uh, of what, you know, how many CPUs was it while running, and that could change dynamically as we go as well. And this will get rescaled if you add more CPUs, for example, but this is three, that's how much we're using. Uh, it doesn't matter what, uh, how many CPUs you actually had in the server. Over here is the uh, memory consumed, and this big red one in here you can see is the database. It's all fake workloads, but uh, you get the idea. Over here we have the block I.O. I'm not faking a lot of uh, disk I.O., but I did actually do some in here, so at least we've got something on the graph to make it a lot more interesting. Now, the, the blue from this one here is uh, the application. Purple is the batch down here, and here's the uh, database. Down here we have the shares. They're all minus one because we're not switched it into controlling mode by allocating shares to particular classes. Uh, and those are used to dis decide what the desired uh, amount of uh, resources they can have and you can see because it's not under control any of these classes and the CPU memory can have 99% so uh, they can do what they want. This is actually quite interesting in here because we have the number of processors and used in system we have 120 processors this is the kernel, the daemons, all those other bits and pieces of AIX itself, the, the actual operating system side of things. There's still 26 things in default that'll be worth investigating what that is. But you can see at the moment uh, the relational database has 19 processes, uh, batch has 3, and applications has 13. A good cross check that you make sure you've got all your uh, database processes. You can manually go and find out how many you are and compare them to what's actually in the class and all the classes that have been activated at the moment. But this isn't just a picture, this is actually dynamic. So we're working at 7 days worth in here. We'll switch it down to two. It will redraw our graphs. So you can see things coming and going. <laughs> it looks a little bit odd with a gap in the middle in here, but this isn't stacked. This is the, the database uh, workloads up here and the applications down in here. There's just nothing in between because the batch wasn't actually running. Um, and then we could go down to have a look more, look at some more detail, go to one day. Um, this is dynamic, so we can actually uh, select a part and, and drill into that. Now we can see the bit more of the uh, workloads, not long term now, which would help us see if the workloads are growing, for example, but uh, drilling into some of the detail. And we could go into uh, more and more detail, and finally we get to the sort of thing that we want to look at to, to learn from. We can see here when the batch is coming up, the database is coming down, so it looks like we're a bit short on uh, CPU power in this uh, logical partition. We can, if uh, we can't see what's going on here, if I hover over it and hit V, I can drill in to see what's going on. So again, we can see the, the peaks and the troughs in here. If we hang on our point, it says the, the database was taking 67% of the CPU. Down here, the application is taking nine. There's a little bit of green creeping in here while there's some things coming and going while we're running. If that was creeping up, then we'd try and work out there's some processes in here, uh, maybe one process growing in the amount of CPU it's taking, or maybe it's more programs actually starting and consuming uh, work. These are uh, dynamic as well, so we go here and click on the edit. We can see all the things we can change. So we'll just show a couple of them. If we increase the line width, the lines get uh, chunkier and chunkier. Uh, so that be an option that you, you quite like. And we can do things like uh, change to uh, bar graphs um, or just a set of points if you're more scientific. Uh, I like the lines joining them up so my, I can follow what's going on. Down in here, if I find the right row, we could uh, stack them on top of each other. So um, the top in here is uh, three, uh, but uh, I prefer them unstacked than uh, we can see them crossing over as well. Lots of things we can, we can play in here to actually get the graph that we actually uh, want. Okay, so we can study our workloads, learn about what's going on, on the machine, and then if you want to, uh, control things. In this little example, you might be saying, well, I don't want the batch slowing down the database as it kicks in, however often it's happening. 
That, if you like, allows you to see what's going on in your computer by looking at the classes and the resources. Now, you might decide, well, that's not right. That's not what I expected. I want to start to fix this. Maybe uh, that class A is the database and we want it to have more capacity in there so that uh, we never want it to go slow. And maybe B is some um, you know, human resources uh, uh, application that isn't really that important. So we may actually want to sort of put some pressure on it to take resources from class B and give them to class A. Now, if you're not constricted on your CPU, then the classes will get whatever they want. You can put hard limits on them. So we could make B never use more than 10%, uh, but then it will just have to throw itself off the CPU, even if there was CPU capacity available to it. If that's what you want, you can do it. Normally, as a performance person, I want to go as fast as possible. When it gets constrained, that I want to set which ones get most of the CPU time. So this is what the shares are about and allows us to control the workloads because we want to challenge this picture. This is a picture, if you like, when the machine is very, very busy. And when it's less busy, it's all the workloads will tell you what they want and uh, not interfere with each other. And when we set these, these uh, numbers are used inside the kernel to affect scheduling, who gets more CPU time or less CPU time, or allocating resources like uh, memory. He said the memory set size for the processors in the class may be forced down if you said you can't use uh, any more than a certain number of uh, or percentage of memory. Um, so CPU control, that does make sense. I've used that on, on occasions if we have like a rogue application that we don't really think that should have that much uh, CPU time. And on the busy period of the week, then we want, want to say, keep this one down, let the database have everything it wants. And typically you want, you're, you're trying to limit things that are going wrong rather than you can't force an application to have more CPU if it has nothing to actually do, right? Uh, memory, well, you've got to be careful there. If you hit hard, set hard limits, then again, you might force B to start paging, even if there's memory, you know, 10 gigabytes free in the, in the LPAR, then you can actually cause it to page. And we know paging is disastrous for your performance. And I've never seen anybody actually do the, the block IO, the disks, because you can't um, do disk IO any faster than it's going to work anyway. All you can do is, is postpone uh, scheduling I.O. for particular classes, which I don't think you really want to do. Uh, in most cases, you just might as well let it do it and the back end disks will come back as soon as they can. OK, now a word on the shares. Everybody thinks, oh, all these shares have to add up to 100 percent. That makes I, that's saying is I can work with that. But it actually turns out, no, that's not a good idea. These shares are not percentage. You, they could be if you make them add up to 100, uh, but there's no need to add up to 100. So in this example, we have uh, three classes, the, the gray, green and, and pink. And now we want to add another one, a blue, and we want it to have, um, I don't know, half of the green size in the uh, processor time. So we can just add a share and uh, seven to three. So that looks about right. Um, and now we're going to put in the new shares. We don't want to have to take, you know, two from this class, two from that class, and one from that class to add it into the new class. And particularly if you've got 28 classes, you drive yourself nuts. So in, in this example, before. Um, a share is 1 14th of the machine, which is 7.14%. And afterwards, we have 17 shares. So each share is 5.88% of the machine. So rather than you having to work that out, just use the shares and it will do the math for you. Everybody starts with percentages and then moves away from it. You better just have numbers like small, new, large, 200, 100, 50, and 25 or something. You say which class each particular workload goes into small medium and large and then you can make final adjustments we'll change them later on that's it then for this quick dip uh workload manager information i've written an ax blog largely the same content as this video although i think i'll go and update it because i've got some better visuals here the red book is here the manual page is here and then there's a lot of commands you can actually use and that where to actually look for the workload management commands etc wlm current i'll put these links in the description of the video if you enjoyed this video then give us a thumbs up thanks for watching